of currency markets. And so I, I have a theory that what is the real currency? Is it a dollar? Is it a Bitcoin? Is it a Litecoin? I think in today's knowledge-driven economy, the real currency is the knowledge and the skill one possesses. But the challenge is how do you measure somebody's knowledge or a skill? It's not easy uh, with just a multiple choice uh, standardized test. Um, so that's where uh, technologies like AI and blockchain will play a very important role. So let me just give you a quick uh, overview. So today, uh, AI is a, a big buzzword, and when you talk about AI, you hear a lot of different terminologies and technologies like natural language processing, computer vision, neural networks, and, uh, and performance of these technologies have also matured significantly. So for example, speech recognition technology today is 95% accurate compared to a human performance, and that has resulted in a significant uh, amount of investment interest from VCs in the AI industry. Last year, I wrote a blog post on how AI will transform the education industry, and uh, you can read more about it on VentureMeet if you're interested. But some of the key areas within the education industry where AI can play a key role are on the administrative side or the academic side, whether uh, helping a student select a course in, in a college, or once they are in a college, how do you help them uh, perform better by providing them tutoring or assessments and instruction. Um, and also other uh, investors and analysts predict that the AI in education industry is going to grow at 43% annual rate. So there's a huge opportunity to disrupt this $1 trillion market. So similar to the AI, blockchain technology will also play an important role because they can help you uh, certify students uh, when, when they are looking for a job. So in a distributed nature, you can put the credentials of the students and uh, employers can easily find it. But in order to do that, you would need to do assessments and uh, credentialing technologies, like how do you evaluate if a student is knowing certain things or not. So for example, you can use AI to automatically grade their answers and give them feedback. Also, you can use AI to provide competency-based uh, certificates and pages, um, which are relevant to the competencies that the employers are looking for. So let me talk uh, briefly about my company's vision and what we are doing. So our mission is to improve the quality and affordability of education with the help of most advanced technologies. And uh, let me give you a context on where the education is and where it is heading. So everybody uh, agrees that the best quality of education takes place in a personalized one-to-one -one environment where there is one teacher available for each student. But the reality is that you are in a classroom with 30 students or uh, in a large lecture hall, where there are like 300 students, or in today's uh, environment, online learning environments called MOOCs, or Massive Open Online Courses, where it's not possible for a professor to give one-to-one uh, -one feedback to each and every student. Um, so some of the best technologies or pedagogies that have shown to be improving the learning outcomes are asking students open response questions and giving them uh, tutoring feedback. But these are also very expensive pedagogies if you rely only on the human support. For example, if you want to uh, assess students learning through open response question in a 30 student classroom, a teacher would have to spend around 20 hours a week on just grading and marking this course. And that's very expensive, and tutoring is even more expensive. So generally, when you see education system, you start to see a degradation in the quality as the scale of the size and implementation increases. And so instead of relying on better quality pedagogies, we start to rely on simpler forms of assessment like multiple choice questions. And so my company's goal is to improve the quality irrespective of the scale of education. And the way we are doing this is based on technologies like AI and virtual assistants like CD or Alexa that people are very much familiar with. So you can converse with uh, Alexa or CD and ask questions and you can come back with an answer. But my company is trying to do slightly different. So instead of AI uh, providing an answer, AI asks you a question and the user has to answer it and then the AI will uh, give a feedback and assessment. So it's a personalized tutoring system that uses open response for grading and provides analytics that are rich and in pedagogical terminologies. So let me give you one example demonstration here. So the student is learning about civic uh, education, how a citizen can participate in government. Uh, so as the student answers the question, uh, 
um, the system is providing them the score. For example, here in this case, is every citizen can vote, and the system gives them a score and a feedback, and the feedback is helping them to better. Similar to the uh, K-12 education, AI can also be useful in medical training or any other adult education environment. So for example, here the student is learning the level of AI how to perform or diagnose a patient. And AI is acting as an expert doctor who is helping a medical student. So in addition to generating rich analytics that the students can uh, benefit from, um, our technology is also applicable across the space. So we work with the varieties of education partners, whether they are in K-12 or higher education or in a professional environment in many different subject areas, um, like science or social studies. And behind the scene, our product uses technology for natural language processing that can analyze the students' written answers using syntactic, semantic, and deeper conceptual analysis to reach a performance that is equal to or very close to the human performance. We have reached 96% accuracy compared to the human. And uh, in many of our controlled studies, we have found that the students uh, really like working with AI to learn something. They were on the best uh, student satisfaction rating. And likewise, professors um, who have used our product, they feel like this is solving the big pain point. And uh, my company has won several awards for our unique innovation, for example, the most innovative EdTech product of the year award. And uh, we have mentioned many different reports for our innovation. So, in a nutshell, um, AI and blockchain technology have a great future to play in terms of transforming our education experiences. For example, we can use AI to help students learn better and therefore improve their learning outcomes. Uh, we can also use AI to improve the teacher's efficiency and productivity by giving them tools. And for the schools and colleges and the governments, AI can be a tool to allow them to scale high quality education um, at an affordable price. So that's uh, about me. Thank you. Good job, Dean. Right. Thank you very much, Dee. It's such interesting work. Thank you very much. So have a safe flight. Such interesting work uh, with artificial intelligence in the education space. Uh, so it's fantastic, uh, fantastic work that they're doing. This intersection also of artificial intelligence and blockchain is something that I've been championing, championing uh, since I stepped back into the space early this year. Okay, Andrew, are you ready? Mario is back. We got we got a presentation up. It's a blue screen. I'm worried here, guys. <laughs> Mario Johnson. Take two. events, non-taxable events, wash sales, and tax loss harvesting optimization, which is a big, big tax strategy for you for this year. Um, I know we've already talked about some of them. We're going to jump into what's some non-taxable events. We've talked about taxable already. So when you are um, buying your coin with fiat, that is not a taxable event. Um, when you're transferring your fiat out of an exchange, assuming you have an, a, a uh, cash wallet, in an exchange, um, and you're just, the act of sending that to your account is not necessarily a taxable event either. Uh, when you go exchange to exchange, so let's say I have some coins on Coinbase and you're gonna send it to Binance, that does not need to be reported anywhere. That is what creates the complications in all of this type of work. Reason for that is cost basis is something that is relevant to every tax transaction. and. For instance, if you bought the coin on Coinbase, they know how much you bought it for. But then you send it to Binance, they don't know how much that purchase, the original coin, was for. So when you sell it on Binance or you exchange it on Binance, 
you have a missing cost basis. So this has to be all reconciled semi-manually. Um, the next thing is if you go from an exchange to a hard wallet, those are not tax reportable events. That's just you moving money from one pocket to another. It's all still within your control. It's not a disposition, it's not a sale. And then finally, some misconceptions about this, but we have um, our opinions, uh, which we stand by as the leader in crypto tax prep, that hard forks in and of themselves are not tax reportable events. When you sell those forked coins, you do have to uh, include those transactions and pay capital gains or have applicable capital losses. Um, but the fact of you just getting the coin handed to you in a fork um, is not a tax reportable event. So let's talk about wash sales. Uh, this is where the tax loss optimization comes in. And we're clearly in a year where we've lost hundreds of billions of dollars in value that um, existed in 2017. Um, what a wash sale is, for those of you who don't know, is was originally kind of came about from stock traders. So stock traders, when they had down positions, they would sell those down positions in order to lock in tax losses. And what the IRS started to see this happening, they said, wow, these people are getting significant tax advantages, and then they're just rebuying the same stock, like five seconds later. So it wasn't a true loss in the IRS's eyes. So they wrote regulations to say, hey, if you have a position in a stock and you sell it, you cannot buy it for rebuy it for 30 days and use that loss. So you have to wait 30 days before you can rebuy it in order to use that loss. Otherwise, it's called a wash sale and you cannot get the benefit of that capital loss. And the good news for us in the crypto world is that those regs were written very specifically to stocks. They do not apply to cryptocurrency currently. That could change in the future. Um, that generally would not change retroactively because these are specific regs that are written and issued already. Um, so what we can do in crypto is something called tax loss harvesting or optimization of these losses that many people have experienced um, in 2018. Uh, the asset value is $850 billion in December. I think we're somewhere in the $100 billion range currently. Um, and uh, that is a significant loss of value that many people had and had realized uh, as gains in 2017. Hopefully you've reported them. If you haven't, you still can. The sooner you do that, the better, uh, because you will get caught, and it's just a matter of time of when and how much penalty interest you will have. Uh, there's ways to avoid that, and we can help with that. But this tax loss harvesting optimization, the way it works is you take those positions and you analyze them. And whichever coins are down, which unfortunately is probably most, um, although we do have many traders that work directly with us that are having phenomenal years because you can short many coins and uh, you can work some other uh, trading strategies, algorithms and bots, etc. But your down positions, you can sell them and then you rebuy them. So you really end up in the same exact place except that you've realized that tax loss. And what that does for you is it puts you in a situation where any future gains you have, whether they be from crypto trades whether they be from other asset sales like stock, securities, real estate, etc., those losses can be used to offset those other gains. You may already have those gains in 2018. You may have traded some other type of asset in this year and you've got some gains that you would have had to pay taxes on. Well, if you lock in these losses, they offset them all in the same bucket on this year's tax return. Now, if you don't have those gains this year, then you'll have them next year. What happens is it carries forward into the next tax year, and you can take those losses against them then. There's one other really cool benefit. Um, even if you don't have other gains from asset sales to offset the um, losses against the gains, you still can take a $3,000 deduction per year against other income. So if you have a W-2, if you have a job, if you have whatever you have, those losses can be used to offset other income as well, but only $3,000. And uh, until you have gains, it'll keep carrying forward. It doesn't only carry forward for one year. So if you had you know, $30,000 of losses, you'd have 10 years of $3,000 deductions against other income, or you can write it off against your next $30,000 in gains, wherever that comes from. You have a question here? Yeah. 
So in stock sales, you get issued a 403B from every stock brokerage, right? A 1099B. Yeah, so 1099B. But in crypto, if I'm day trading crypto, right? I have 30 transactions a day for six months. Who's tracking that? And how is the IRS going to really reconcile so many people's 30 transactions a day? So first off, you're responsible as a taxpayer to reconcile that. Whether you do it yourself or you hire a professional to help you with that um, is the challenge. Um, the reality is all this data exists, right? You're on these exchanges. Uh, you can do it CSV download. Again, there's going to be holes in it if you're moving coin from exchange to exchange. Um, so we work what's called the reconciliation process where we aggregate all that data into one of our software tools um, and we fill in the blanks. We've got a whole team of crypto reconciliation specialists that handle that for you and then get that into the tax return. The reality is those exchanges, they're just like stock brokers. They're holding that data. As I mentioned before, they all have in their terms of service and they will turn it over once they're asked. The IRS is just waiting and finishing up their process and procedures to ask. I guess the question was, does the IRS really have the manpower to go through that many transactions for that many people? Yeah, the IRS has the most powerful computer systems that exist. They currently do this for all the other stock transactions that are out there, and they have billions upon billions of pieces of data that come into them every year <coughs> from wages, from other trades, from you name it, uh, mortgages, etc. So they absolutely have it. They didn't have the bandwidth this year because of tax reform to roll out um, and come into the crypto space the way that they're planning to, uh, but they certainly will. And you know what, they go backwards. They don't say, hey, don't worry about anything that happened in the past. Once they get hands on this data, they just feed it into their computer systems and they have a, a, an automatic um, audit process that says, hey, if we have this data coming in and we don't match it on the appropriate tax return, send out the letter. They don't need manpower, they already have it and they just have to fine tune their systems already a, a little bit. They've hired a firm called Chain Analysis, which many of you may have heard that is helping them to uh, refine these systems and to uh, have these processes in place in order to go out and send these letters out. They've already started some enforcement. I believe they had their first seizure of coins last week. Um, they have a, a criminal investigation division. Um, they're not looking the other way on this. In fact, the IRS commissioner came out two weeks ago at an industry conference stating that 2019 will be the year of compliance with crypto because they have more data than anyone even realizes currently and it's just a matter of them massaging into their systems. In fact, you mentioned you have 30 trades or so a day. We've actually had traders that have had hundreds of thousands of trades from bots that we've helped them to reconcile, report, stay compliant. Do you have a follow-up? But if you never come out of the crypto world, right? I have Bitcoin, I traded for Litecoin, then I traded for Ripple and XYZ, and I'm using that currency and I never come back to fiat, what do you take as the basis of the capital gain? The basis is how much you bought those specific coins for versus US dollars at the point that you bought it. Initially? Not initially, so on each trade. Each trade has its own basis. So each trade, if you went from Bitcoin to Litecoin to Ethereum, when you bought the Bitcoin, that's your basis there. When you exchange it for Ethereum, there's your sales price, which also is your basis on the Ethereum. And then you sold that for Litecoin, and then that becomes your basis for the Litecoin and your sales price for the Ethereum in that example. So every transaction becomes a new basis. Every transaction has a new basis and every transaction has to be reported on the tax return. It goes into a form for an 8949 and it flows into a Schedule D. Um, it is a cumbersome process to aggregate all this data um, and that's where our team comes in to help with all that. Thank you got some you. other questions? Yes, sir. Um, there are dozens currently of softwares out there for that reconciliation process. I'm not going to make a specific recommendation. Um, some work better for different scenarios. There's things like foreign asset reporting, there's things like market margin trades, there's high volume, there's low volume, and there's, these tools are all being refined. Prior to this year, there was two of them. Now there's literally dozens, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll start to wrap it up here now. What do you need to implement this tax loss harvesting? You need a closing balance report for the end of the year as a starting point. You need your trades year to date. Uh, you need to analyze which of those coins to sell and then rebuy to lock in the savings. Um, and then you really need to do a, a reconciliation checkup. You need to make sure that all of your trades are ready. And that's going to help you into the next year when you are ready to file.
Here's an example. Somebody had $100,000 uh, in this example in, at the end of 2017. They probably have about twenty dollars or $30,000 yet. This example shows about thirty. dollars um, If you implement this strategy, uh, you'll have $28,000 in tax savings as a result of implementing tax force harvesting. Um, and if anyone's interested in utilizing our services, you can check out cryptotaxprep.com slash pricing. We've got a coupon code for you for $500 off. It's WASH500. And you certainly have um, our, we have your back in terms of anything that we can do to help you provide, stay compliant, stay out of trouble, and not have any penalties interest. Thank you so much. Awesome. Mario. That was as, as informative and scary <laughs> as I thought it would be. Uh, he, he, <laughs> uh, but you guys, it's, it's a really, it's a, like he said, everybody needs to take note. It has been a bit of the, uh, the Wild West, uh, but you heard 2019 is going to be uh, the year of compliance. And we all just lost money this year in the crypto market, right? So make sure you go through, you do your stuff, contact Mario. Mario, what's your website? CryptoTaxPrep.com. CryptoTaxPrep.com. I, uh, I encourage all of you guys to reach out to him. It's a fantastic uh, program and, and, and everything that he's doing there. So next up, I have Mr. Andrew Prell. We have the right uh, thing loaded up here. Mr. Runs of the Unicorns, Kentucky Derby. Unfungible tokens, Andrew Prell. Uh, well, that's what a first in my life, <laughs> and I'm not a young puppy, but who else found tax law interesting all of a sudden? <laughs> wow, that's a very good speaker today. That was awesome. So I've got to follow him up. All right, I was asked to, to do the virtuous circle of a token-based investment fund. Okay? That uh, has gotten a lot of... Um, Notoriety through economists. How many economists in the room? One. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you all find this as compelling as uh, a lot of other people have. I've written several medium articles that got me to that. One was the blockchain versus the VC, which is the 10 investment funds that we are um, implementing, gamifying venture capital and allowing one of the funds to be controlled by a token holders, that led us to why, and that's the virtuous circle of a token-based investment fund. You can find both of them on Medium, but I'm gonna go into detail here. Now, obviously, you know, I'm for the convergence. If you were here yesterday, and we're working on the Silicon Nexus project, and we're all about video games. Now, who in the room has not read the book or seen Ready Player One? All right, so that looks like about half the room. So, so you all can know what's in my head, what's in the head of a gamer. How many in here are gamers? All right, so you all, the gamers are going to love this, and everybody else should figure out why we find this so compelling. Because to this, if, you're, if it runs the video... Is it not running the video? That's fine. All right, well, I'll talk about it. Basically, Ready Player One is so compelling to us because all of the technology in that movie exists today. Matter of fact, I've been working on it myself and the team has been working on that kind of technology. All of those devices, the treadmills, the, the tactile feedback suits, all of that stuff. I've been working on it since 1988. That stuff is real to us. That's coming down the pike, whether we like it or not, it's happening around us. Um, and I, you all should at least go see the movie, it's pretty cool. So the question is, how much does it cost to build? We set out to build this back in um, 2014. To be honest, we've really been working on it since 1988, but <laughs> this project part, we, we decided it's time to do it in 2014. And like good engineers, we set out to put a, a bill of material cost on what it's going to do to do just the design build portion of it. It came to over a billion dollars. And we checked that all of our bank accounts didn't have that much in it. So we decided we had to invent money. 
I don't know if you all realize this, but video games have had virtual economies and virtual currency for almost 30 years. That virtual currency and virtual economy has had real world value for almost 30 years. The only thing it was missing was the blockchain to secure it so those things can transact in the real world easily without getting ripped off. Because once you convert virtual items from a video game to real world cash, there's over 70% um, over 70% fraud problem that the blockchain gets rid of. So that was our answer. We're going to just invent this money and go forward. And I ran over this yesterday. There's over 50 million people in blockchain today and about 7 billion people on the planet and over 2 billion gamers. But this is how the consumer game economy works today. It's all wrapped around a dollar bill. You have developers, publishers, equipment manufacturers, players, and media, all that's in, in the game for themselves. If any one of them gets wealthy, it does not help the others. So it's a, you know, that pretty much creates a, hate to say it, a backstabbing economy that everybody's in it for themselves because it's all wrapped around the dollar bill. We're marrying that to the consumer, to the out-of-home entertainment side, which is a little more complex, but it's still wrapped around the dollar bill. Everybody's in it for themselves. We're pushing that to a token economy. And in a token economy, magical things happen because people don't have to be out for themselves anymore. If one person makes the token go up in value, it goes up for everybody, so people are more apt to help each other. Now let me go into a lot of detail and let you see the real impact of this. And anybody remember when the Xbox came out? <laughs> it was a unique time in the consumer game console market. Microsoft had tried five times before. Sony, PlayStation, had just kicked out of the market Sega and Nintendo. They owned the market. They, they, I mean, lock, stock, and barrel, it was theirs. And Microsoft was coming out with the Xbox, and this time they decided to come with all guns blazing and gave Kevin Backus, who happens to be on my team, <laughs> pretty much I'll just say a briefcase full of money, of, you know, dollar bills. That was the medium he used to run around, and he invested in like a thousand different content manufacturers to have content for this platform. Because video games is a hit driven business, and as Tim Chang has eloquently put it in the past, you know, in any hit-driven business, content is king. Nobody can predict which content's going to explode, but on any given platform, some content will explode. But anywhere the content is king, distribution of that content is God Almighty. So he went around and he looked for, for the killer app for the Xbox, so to break into the market, and he used the dollar bill. And he found one piece of content that just exploded. Who knows what that piece of content was? Xbox Live? No, well before Xbox Live. It was Halo. 24 million people bought the Xbox exclusively to play Halo. Right now it's over 110 million people. Okay? And that had a network effect. Everybody's familiar with the network effect. 24 million people came to the Xbox to play. Halo, 10 million went over to this other game because they wanted two games to play, not just one, and five million over here. That's the network effect. But it's a limited network effect, meaning all the games on the Xbox didn't get to 24 million people. Halo did, okay? Because he used the dollar bill as a medium. Had he used an Xbox token and made everybody get the content through the same medium, the Xbox token, something magical would have happened. Okay? When Halo exploded, 24 million people would have flocked to the Xbox token. How many people's in crypto today? About 50 million? So half would be on one token? It would have exploded. That token would have gone way up in value. I mean, there's 50 million people that at one point in time was responsible for what, $800 billion in value? So half of those went to one token? What would have happened? That would have definitely gone from like a penny to a dime, at least, right? <laughs> yeah. 
and all boats would rise together. So his, if he put $100,000 into 1,000 companies, he now had a million dollars into 1,000 companies. What would that do? It would have given 1,000 companies more runway. So instead of ending up with one halo out of 1,000, he might have had two or three. That would have been very impactful. But even better than this, if the slide will advance, there we go, is everybody in the ecosystem would have 10x or 100x or 1,000x because somebody found Halo. And that's the virtuous circle of a token-based economy, a token-based investment fund, is the fact that one person that owns those tokens does something that increases the value, it increases the value for everybody. <laughs> When was the last time that somebody 10 x the dollar bill? You have to get more dollar bills to have more value. With tokens, you don't. You have to, you can get more tokens to have more value, but if you, your token goes up in value, mm -hmm. you've doubled your, you know, how much value you have. That's infinitely more powerful. Most people don't comprehend what that truly means in an ecosystem like this. Now here, this is a typical World of Warcraft player's items in his game. Some of those can be worth a thousand dollars, some of them are worth, or, you know, like maybe half a penny or something. But those are non-fungible tokens, and those also can go up and down in value like that and can be traded around. The difference are those are kind of singular. So you know, when I say singular, that can be like one set that all of a sudden that one thing, there might be a thousand of them in the game, those go up in value, it doesn't have the same effect. But if you used right, it drives people back to the token. <coughs> so those, well, that's our, uh, our non-fungible tokens on our crowdfunding page, but um, in our tokenomics, the way we designed it was 38% is designed to reward players for playing the games, and 37% um, is designed to invest, be that, you know, what Kevin Backus had to do with the Xbox, we have to do with our ecosystem. So we broke that up into 10 investment funds. That was the first article, which is the uh, blockchain versus the VC, and I gamified it. <laughs> so that would be something for you all to look at as well. But that's um, effectively what I want to talk about. I'll talk about the rest of this. Uh, later on in the pitch competition, but this is how you all get involved. Um, and thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you for all. It's, uh, I'll tell you, and uh, we've been going back and forth. I don't know if uh, there's not a whole lot of people that have traveled much more than I have over the past uh, year or so, but Andrew Prell is one of them. He's got to be right up there. I know back and forth to Asia. And everything else, and uh, I think you're uh, going over to Singapore again very soon, right? Uh, we hope to do a test in Singapore within, within 30 days. Within 30 days. Uh, he's got a big deal that he's working on there. So uh, I believe next we have uh, Mark Wazer. Is that right? Wasser. Wasser. Mark Wasser. He is a, a bit of an icon in the space, an artificial intelligence space, a machine learning. Uh, I'm happy to have him on board. I know he's worked on a few uh, different projects. I'll let him explain it to you. Uh, please give a hand for Mark Wasser. Thank you. So as Bruce said, I'm an artificial intelligence guy. Been doing it for about three and a half decades. Um, and at this point now, I am solidly a blockchain guy. And the reason why is that you all are developing all the tools, I mean, ecosystem, necessary to develop my passion project, which is using AI to benefit the world. Now, you'll sort of notice that there's only AI there in the subtitle. And I'm not gonna actually talk that much about AI. What's much more important to me is collective intelligence. What happens when you get a group of people together we're actually better, a group of people, plus AI tools, plus eventually individual artificial general intelligences. And you can do tremendous things together.
Blockchain tends to make that all possible because of all the ways in which you can do crowdsourcing, all the ways in which you can do microtransactions. So basically, I'm standing up here to do a big pitch to help me finish my passion project. Uh, maybe the second computer. Yeah. All right, there we go. So back in 200, there was this really pessimistic piece in Wired by Bill Joy. It basically said, you know, the future really doesn't need us. There are all sorts of things that are starting to stack up against us. There will be these super intelligent machines, corporations are basically sociopathic entities that really are legally bound to chase money at the expense of all else. And of course, capitalism is kind of a problem. And at this point, human beings, I mean, a teenager with YouTube can do amazing things that no one could have done 200 years ago. I mean, my wife will go and do car repair based on YouTube videos. And of course, AI seems to be turning into a problem currently. Fundamentally, it's being used to harvest your information. It's being used to addict you to things, to figure out what your weak spots are. It's being used to sway political elections. This, this is a problem, and I really love the bottom throat there. The fact that everyone's worried, Elon Musk is worried about how computers are getting more and more intelligent, they're gonna take over the world. And the answer is no, they're stupid, but they already control us. How many of you have had problems where you or your assistant have to fix a problem with the company, you call up, and they can't fix the problem because their system won't let them? A lot of our problem currently is we can't get ourselves acting together to do things. We're all small people, though actually this room is unique in that we actually do have enough clout that many of us can do what we want to do. Fundamentally, until we fix the problems of communication, until we figure out ways in which grassroots can actually act effectively, collectively, we're gonna to continue to have this problem. Blockchain is the very thing that's gonna enable us to do that. It enables a lot of people to work together, even if we don't trust each other. This is why you want blockchain in government, why you want transparency. Here, this, this is just one of my standard slides on blockchain. I use it all the time. But one of the things that I've seen, I got this slide from the same source, is everyone goes, blockchain is so difficult. You have to start with a huge investment, and then you've got to have collaboration. It's like, no, no. There, there are much easier ways to do that. And there are people here working for easier ironings. I mean, you just heard a talk. So, I would argue that artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency is like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Though I would much prefer that we start talking about collective intelligence. And I'm not really a huge cryptocurrency fan. I think blockchain is wasted on cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency provides awesome incentives, ways to make payments for you know, tasks performed, you're gonna be able to change the world. But my real frustration is, is that you can't use Bitcoin for these things. You've gotta be able to use microtransactions and things of that sort in order to both change the world and also enable a lot of the projects that we're talking about. So there are currently AI efforts on the blockchain. These are just a list of those people who say, I'm doing AI. I've had an ICO. Most of them have zero development if you go to their GitHub sites. One very interesting effort, however, is one that is basically an auditor for all AI type actions. And this is something that I think that we're gonna need. It would be nice though if it didn't only apply to AI. If people take major actions in the real world, I think those things should be documented. I think we need to figure out the balance between privacy, but also responsibility and accountability. There are also, of course, all the people who are using AI to theoretically make money. Um, 
Honestly, I've made a bit of money with my bots. Not a lot of money, though. And it's going to get tougher and tougher. I mean, most of us are going to be outcompeted by the firms that are actually using collective intelligence effectively. Um, there's also important things like the developments in social media. They're doing a lot of things, figuring out what's valuable and not in blogging, in terms of reviews of companies and the like. There is also reputation-based systems, the scariest of which is China's Sesame credit system. It will be on a blockchain. It's going to cause interesting things. I don't know how many people actually watch Black Mirror, but there are all sorts of things that you can do with computers if people don't regulate you properly. And of course, there are crowdsourcing tasks. I should have added the one from earlier today. There's also gems, and these are very important things so that anyone can get involved in the crypto area, can do great things, can be reimbursed from them, can be incentivized to do things for my project. So one of our biggest problems currently is that there are far too many black box systems. The um, DARPA, the Defense and Advanced Research Projects Agencies, just put a lot of money behind explainable AI. And fundamentally, we need to know, be able to document why AI is doing what it's doing, because there are far too many ways to spoof an AI currently. They're really stupid, and we got to fix this as a problem. And most of the problem is that the artificial intelligence that we have now is fundamentally just tools. They're things that human beings, artifacts that we've put together. And there's a major split in the AI community about whether it's actually a good idea to create truly artificial entities, entities that are human level intelligence. And fundamentally, the argument is, and this is from a paper, it's a great paper, basically says that if you have an AI and it's improving itself, and that's really the only way that we're gonna create one, it will tend to do these things, because if it doesn't do these things, it won't advance and it'll die. The problem is, is they also decided in that paper to say that just like corporations, an AI is gonna turn into a sociopath because it wants to do what's most effective. Now the obvious counter argument is everyone in the, hu everyone in the room is basically an AI. Well, you're a natural intelligence, most of us. So fundamentally, about a decade, I'd say more about six years ago or so, a group of us got together and said, you know, we really do need to start promoting the creation of safe, moral, artificial intelligence, which sort of is a byproduct on the way. We actually lay out all the foundations so we can also judge people and corporations, and all these other entities which sort of optimize their advantages selfishly. You know, corporations have, you know, the things they get tracked on and what they're accountable for, and all these externalities. And all these externalities are killing us. So we actually have a number of projects. One is the actual attempt to grow in AI through crowdsourcing. We've been doing this for about five years. There are a couple of papers out there on the various scientific journals. We're also trying to create a solid system. In 2012 to 2013, there was a real renaissance of information-based debate and argument systems. And we think that that needs to come back. We need to document what people's arguments are, what turned out to be true, what didn't turn out to be true, until we start paying attention to history, until we need to, until we make it impossible to have weaponized narratives, we're in a lot of trouble. You, you've gotta know what's going on to be successful. And of course, we're also trying to provide a nice on-ramp to cryptocurrency. Um, my particular company is actually applied to the SEC to be a crowdfunding portal. We're working with BlockBlocks out of 
Kentucky so that they've got Reg D support. Um, a lot of people have missed out on our biggest market because no one wants to do an IPO. I don't like the word ICO. They're, they're really IPOs in the United States, and I, I think we need to start doing that. And also, if we enable the ability to fund small projects, we can also crowdsource a lot of stuff that's really valuable and it'll enable us to move forward on all these efforts. So just an interesting finale is that what people don't realize is that human beings are generally much better behaved than they have to be, than they're forced to be. And the reason why is emotionally we're wired for morality. We have a moral sense. And if you pass that through, everyone's arguing, how can we teach our machines morality? Some of the people go, oh, let's do machine learning to figure out what morality is. What's really interesting in the debate is that half a dozen years ago, the social psychologists, the ones who are the experts at all this, have basically defined what morality is. You know, they said, look, we can't tell you on a specific instance because we have the equivalent of the AI frame problem, but the purpose of morality is just to make it possible to live and work together, to prevent selfishness, over-optimizations, that type of thing. And as long as you're doing that, you're going to be moral. So it's kind of interesting. A human being looks like it has goals of this type. You can assume that in AI it's going to be absolutely the same. There's also the fact that you can do this. And the final question is, which blockchain are we going to use? Most of the blockchains there aren't where we need them to be for smart contracts. You know all the problems with Ethereum, with EOS. We're actually using a variant of NEO that actually gets rid of gas because it has all the smart contract problems in terms of pricing. But my remaining question is, who wants to join us in building this ecosystem? Thanks.